the Matildas obviously um, becoming a powerhouse in, in women's football nationally, internationally, sorry. Do you feel like, especially through the, the, the fantastic news of us obviously hosting the 2023 Women's World Cup, how much of an impact do you reckon that has on potentially introducing a, a newer range of you know fans to the game? Because I feel, I feel like for years that, you know, the women's national team has a huge part to play in giving, you know, I guess maybe the country an ident- a bigger identity in football, considering that, you know, when the next the World Cup comes here in a couple of years' time, we have we will have for the first time a world event for the world game with all eyes on this country in the women's res- respect. It's arguably a huge moment in one of the biggest moments potentially in um, Australian sports history in recent memory anyway. Yeah, look, there's no doubt it's it's great that, that we've got a World Cup here, um, but that there are. Uh, two big questions before we get sort of tied up in the platitudes of saying, oh, this is great. It's going to be wonderful. It will be. It'll be terrific for those six weeks. What happens before and what happens after? Those are my two big questions. Because if you remember in 2015, Australia hosted the Asian Cup and did a really good job of hosting it as well. And people were very engaged with it. And of course, what happened at the end, soccer is won. We won a major trophy. The whole country watched that game everybody loved the Socceroos everybody knew who the team was that was the moment to capitalize on that huge event and the feel-good factor and what happened A-league attendances and TV ratings dropped off a cliff because at the end of that tournament everybody went job done brilliant see you later we're off on holiday what is the long-term plan to harness the feel-good effect of that tournament in 2023. Even before that, what is the plan to get government investment because we've got a World Cup coming to this? I'm not just talking about, you know, upgrade a training facility and then in six months' time, a rugby league team comes and takes it or an Aussie rules team comes and takes it, which incidentally is what happened in a place called Cessnock near Newcastle. which had a nice stadium refurbished uh, for Japan, who based themselves there during the Asian Cup in 2015. And it's now basically a rugby league ground. What, what, what's the legacy for football from that? Zero. My fear is something similar will happen uh, around the Women's World Cup. So that's the first thing. We have to get football in- infrastructure, not for rugby league or Aussie rules or cricket, football infrastructure on the back of a World Cup because it's football that's bringing that tournament here and that money here. Secondly, on the back of that World Cup, what is the plan specifically for the W League? Are we going to expand it? How do we get crowds to come and watch the W League? Crowds will always come and watch the national teams. They'll watch the Matildas. And if they win the trophy, and hopefully they do, yes, there'll be a huge buzz as there was with the Socceroos in 2015. But what happens after to the domestic tournament? What's the plan to increase the size of that league, to make it more successful commercially, to get more people in the stands, to get more people watching it on television? Because I can tell you at the moment, very few people watch the W League. And that's a real disappointment. So for all this, you know, women of the future and the the Women's World Cup, and it's going to be great for women's football. It's great for women's sport. Well, okay. What's the, what's the plan? Because at the moment in Europe, the big games in the women's leagues over there are drawing crowds of 30,000, 40,000. We're lucky if we get three or 400 to some of the games here. So there has to be a strategy. Um, and I'm not bit trying to be overly negative because it's brilliant we've got the Women's World Cup here, but I don't just want it to be as it was with the Asian Cup, six weeks of wow, and then let's forget about it and move back to watching cricket and Aussie rules and rugby league. What's the plan for football? Oh, exactly. And that's, we've, we've seen, as you said, we've seen this movie before. It's obviously, we're just seeing obviously the next part of this, the sequel, is it? is the ending the same really and it's yeah. a hard one considering that as you said rugby aussie rules all these sports are so entrenched into our you know national mindset that you know everything takes second place third place fourth place and we still have a 
huge problem with obviously that. but that shouldn't be good enough for sorry to interrupt george yeah. you see for too long we've accepted that for too long we've gone oh we can't challenge rugby league and aussie rules and we can't do this and we can't do that we've got to start standing up for ourselves we should have done it in 2015 this is one of Ange postacoglu's big frustrations by the way that there was no plan moving forward not just for the socceroos so we've got to start standing up for our sports and saying this is a football world cup and and i've been irritated by some of the language used in promoting this world cup it's going to be great for women it's going to be great for sports it's going to be great for australia what about great for football it's a football event what about football in this country we don't take care of football enough in this country we didn't after the asian cup and we run the risk in my opinion if we're not careful of doing something similar with the Women's World Cup. There has to be a plan and a legacy for football.